Hey y'all, what's happening? Chinese here, also known as China L. Colston, actress and independent filmmaker here in Brooklyn, but from Chicago. How y'all doing? I hope y'all Thursday is going really well. So I wanted to just share some things that I have learned when I'm learning as an independent filmmaker with those who aspire to be an independent filmmaker or just a filmmaker on GP. Um, one, I was, let me just say that I was definitely, um, I've been influenced by many films, um, mostly feature films, mostly films that, were, that I saw in the cinema. Um, uh, and I'll tell you the filmmakers, let me start by telling you the filmmakers who influenced me most of all. Um, any filmmaker who has, um, any producer or director of any Bruce Lee films, um, they have definitely influenced me. Um, uh, Mahogany, Barry Gordy, Mahogany, Lady Sing the Blues, um, Claudine, um, Love Jones, A Double in the Blue Dress, um, most of Woody Allen films, um, most of Spike Lee films. Spike Lee films have had the most, I would say Spike Lee and Spike Lee films have had the most Im impact on me as a f filmmaker. Um, Pedro Almodovar out of Madrid, Spain has had a great impact on the color palette of my films. Um, let's see. I must say the good times Good Times, although it's not a feature film, has had a major impact on how I want, how I want to illustrate um, romantic love, right? Um, love Jones has had an impact on me, particularly my first film, Journey of the Heart. Major impact. You see all the Love Jones influences in that film. Let's just I'll just be very frank with you. Um, so shout out to Teddy Witcher or Theodore Witcher, the director and writer of the classic Love Jones out of Chicago. Thank you for your influence. Thank you, Spike Lee. Oh my God, Spike Lee. Um, my favorite Spike Lee film is Mo Better Blues, tied with Malcolm X. Um, let me see who else. Um, let me see. Um, uh, Robert Townsend, um, Hollywood Shuffle definitely has influenced me greatly. Um, trying to think. Um, I think that's, I know I'm going to miss, I know I'm missing something. Oh, um, uh, Lord, New Jack City, of course. New Jack City, Sugar Hill, Superfly, Carmen Jones. Um, those films have influenced me greatly. Cleopatra Jones has influenced me greatly. Um, ooh, I think that's pretty much it. If I think of anything else, it'll, it'll, uh, I'll probably share it or put it in the video. So those films have in, in, influenced me greatly. Um, and, and John Singleton, I want to miss John Singleton. Um, Boys in the Hood, I love Higher Learning. I think Higher Learning is actually my favorite film. Um, it's it's tied with Boys in the Hood. It's, it's tied, I, I love Boys in the Hood. Uh, anyway, so I have learned on my little engine that could films. Um, one, when, because I write, all of my films, I've co, I've co-written one of my films, and I've had some contributions with one of the films, Same Old Same Old. So Same Old Same Old, I had a contributor, a writing contributor, um, and and um, to, and Big Chops, I had a contributor, two contributors. Rest in peace to Sheldon McCullough. Rest in peace to Sheldon McCullough and Sean Williams, who is a actor and writer, clearly. Um, so outside of those two films, I've written all my films. I wrote Journey of the Heart by myself, Discontinued by myself, Dark Seed, my baby, by myself, um, 
and in um, Sweet Thing. And I have new films that I'm writing on to cook when I to cook. I love you, Jimmy. And um, those are the two that I'm currently writing on. So um, in production, when you are, rest in peace to Aaron Ingram, because he was, he was supposed to, um, he was excited to direct Dark Seed, but unfortunately he passed away the year before we were, we were to go into filming. So rest in peace to Aaron Ingram. He was the co-founder of the Act Now Foundation, which was established in Brooklyn. He was a wonderful um, director. He directed me in two stage readings and he was really excited to direct Dark Seed. And I trusted him wholly as an actress. Every time you give him direction, I was like, that makes so much sense. And it improved my interpretation greatly. So I'm really, really grateful that he and I connected artistically and as human beings on GP. So rest in peace to Aaron Ingram. Um, so the reason I brought up Aaron Ingram is because he was a wonderful director. So I, if you hire, if you write your, your screenplay, whether it be a short or feature film, which is a full-length film, make sure you look at you sit down and talk to the directors. And I'm gonna go back. I've only, yeah. Most of my most of my films were directed by me. One film was not. Um, and I wish that were not the case, looking back. So when you when you hire a director to direct a film that you've written and or are producing, make sure that you, as a writer, screenwriter, you sit down with him or her and you all talk about each scene in the script and, and you need to express to the director how you envision, well, you give the script to the director that you hired or if you have several directors that you're, you're considering to take on the role of director, and you submit, you send all email, all email your scripts to all of these three directors, these three directors, let's say, and you have a meeting with each director, right? And let's say you're acting in as well, like I usually do. You have a meeting with each director after they've read your screenplay, and you ask them how do they how do they envision or how do they plan on realizing each scene? Um, how do they see? the direction of the character. Um, yeah, and especially if you're acting in, because if you discover that these three directors or two of them are not, their vision is not in line with what you envision, cut them loose, cut them loose. Um, that's one. If you tell, you have a, as a producer, when you hire a director, say you hire a director, you found somebody that fits their vision and your vision of the story unfolding lines up, right? Fine. You have to tell them it is the director's job. If you do not, if you do not hire a storyboard artist, then it is that it is that director's job. You communicate to that director as a screenwriter, producer, or just screenwriter, um, actress that. They must create a storyboard for your film. They must create a shot list for your film. Because when you are on location, let's say you're acting in your film that you wrote like myself, um, and you've hired this director, director and a cinematographer and or camera operator, they need to be in sync, both like, so the director and the cinematographer and or camera operator, they should all have the storyboard and they need to be in sync. They need to make sure those shots are captured. They need to make sure that the central, all of the characters, particularly this, the lead characters and the sporting characters, that there is a close-up, 
a medium shot, a long shot, an over the shoulder shot, a reaction shot. Make sure that, so that's why the purpose of the storyboard, so that the director, because there's a lot going on that he is he or she is directing, they need to have a storyboard to reference so they don't miss any important shots for the film, okay? To tell, to tell the story effectively. You need the shot list to reference the shot list. They must do it. If they do not, if they do not produce a storyboard for you, the screenwriter, actress, producer, oh, two weeks before filming, then you get rid of them and you hire someone else. Okay, do that. Because trust me, when you when you wrap finish wrapping the movie and you're now you're in an editing aspect of it and you don't have certain shots, certain key shots, you're gonna be livid, take my word. Storyboard, shot list to make sure all shots have been captured, okay? We don't wanna rely on the director's memory because they may not, they may be forgetful, take my word. Um, the cinematographer, when you hire a cin and make sure also when a director is, is let's say you're the, you're the lead actor and you wrote it, make sure that when they talk to you and let's say you're doing it, your two takes of a scene, make sure, or I would suggest, not make sure, I would suggest that when they call action, they call it quietly. Now your approach may be differently, but for me, I don't need you shouting action. I need you to just say action or whenever you're ready. So that everybody is relaxed. So that, so that me, I'm relaxed. The other actors are like, we're relaxed. It's a relaxed environment. Um, if they have a, for me, this may not work for you, but for me, if I do a take and I say, I'm not resting, I'm not, conveying truth, a truthful emotion, then the director, instead of humiliating you, director can, you can ask, you can and talk about this prior to you filming. I want you, if we're, if you're directing me in the scene on location, come to my ear and make the adjustment. Now, I will also suggest some actors don't like to rehearse for on camera. I don't believe in that. I, believe, I make discoveries as an actress I make discoveries of my characters through rehearsal, right? Before we start filming. So you can make a lot of discover you can make a lot of discoveries if you're again, this is if you wrote it, the movie and you're starring in it or being a supporting actor in it. Rehearse with the director prior to filming. So you can you and the director can make discoveries together of what's the optimal choices for the character, right? You can make these discoveries together. Make sure you have more than one rehearsal. You have a rehearsal with the director and the, re and the director has rehearsals with the other actors and then with myself and the other actors. So rehearsing, storyboard, shot lists, all this prior to filming. And then you can talk to the director about what's the best approach when he's directing you or she's directing you on location. You know, uh, you, you may be like, I don't mind them saying action or I don't mind them making corrections of my interpretation in front of everybody. I don't work like that. I'd rather you come to my ear and say, China, can you do that? Can you do do A? Try A, B, and C, D, E. Let's try that and see how maybe that's more impactful. Because right or China right now, what you're communicating is not as clear as you think it is. So try A, B, C, D, and let's see how that works. But come into my, come to me, in my ear, or your ear, and that way it's just the adjustment is communicated to you, just you, not the cast, not the other crew you and the director communicate and then you can go ahead and do your interpretation. So that works for me, that may not work for you. Um, yes, cinematographer. I think it's the same thing. When you hire, when you seek out cinematographers for your film, um, ask to see their reel. But if they don't have a reel that reflects um, scenes from a feature film or a short that they have shot themselves, do not hire a cinematographer who has not filmed a movie. 
it has not worked for me. When I've hired someone who did not, who's never filmed a movie, whether it be a short or feature, there are some things that that individual forgot to capture. It's because they've done other things that are on camera projects, but not a narrative, not a fictional movie, not a movie. So really make sure that they have a strong um, cinematography reel that they can email to you and you can see the diversity of their reels, like how well they shoot um, people, how well they shoot landscapes. Um, do they have an interesting creative flair in the cinematography? Is it just very standard? You get to see their aesthetic as a cinematographer through their reel. Um, I would not suggest hiring a cinematographer who wants to try it out, wants to try it out. If you're doing experimental short film, then that's cool. But if it's like a film that you're really serious about, I would not suggest hiring somebody who's never filmed a narrative or short narrative feature, feature film, feature film or short. I would not suggest doing that. Pub, um, lighting person, make sure the lighting person again can show you a reel of their work. Do not, I would not suggest hiring somebody who's never done lighting for a film, for a movie. Now, there are exceptions when it comes to lighting because my brother, my brother in spirit, Sheldon, Sheldon McCullough, who passed away, he was a wonderful still photographer. I modeled for him when I was much younger and someone hired him to do lighting for their feature, for their feature film. And he was wonderful. But he also had been studying motion picture for a long time. And he went, to, he took filmmaking in college. So he's an exception because he had taken filmmaking in college. It wasn't, it wasn't a major, but he had taken some filmmaking classes in college and he was a photographer. So that merger of the formal knowledge about filmmaking and being a photographer too. So he's an exception. Um, but for the most part, I would not hire someone who's only done lighting for photography, but never for film. I would not suggest you do that. If you are, if you have a, and if someone asks you if they can be a production assistant on your uh, movie, if they ask you, um, and let's say you have a, a minimal budget where you can't pay them, but they, they ask you because they want the experience, they want to learn um, beyond location and really learn about how filmmaking works, at least indie films. Make sh and, and let's say you say, we're going to have several production meetings I need you to attend, right? Because you'll be assisting with the crew and they do not show up to any of the meetings, fire them. Yeah, do that because they're gonna be sloppy once they get on location. Because the fact that they've chosen not to, uh, not attend the production meetings, pre-filming, pre pre-production meetings, they're telling you that they don't take it seriously and it's gonna show up on location when it's time to film. They're just there for the, they're just there to show on Instagram that they're part of a film production, but they're not really serious. So don't, don't work with people like that. I would suggest don't do, don't hire them. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Sound person. Um, if you hire a sound person, make sure they have a reel um, demonstrating their sound um, quality. Um, the, the expertise of the sound in narratives, short or feature films. I had an experience whereby I told the sound, he was a sound designer, sound person. He, um, and I said to him, cause he had the little, I forgot the little um, recording devices. I said, please save it onto your desktop as soon as you get home, just in case you misplace the sound, the recording devices, cause they're so tiny. Just save it that way. We can just, if you do lose it, we'll have it, right? 
and that's the clean, what he records is a clean audio. So we can add that clean audio and editing, right? Because there's like external noises if we're shooting outdoors or wherever, we still need clean sound audio from the actors. So this individual did not do as I requested. He said, oh yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. And he didn't do it. And so we had to, I was left with like not so great sound in one of my films in at least at least two of the scenes because this person ignored my request to save it onto his desktop because he misplaced the, the recording devices. So you can imagine how livid I was. Um, shout out to David, David Janet for fixing the audio in that particular film. Um, yeah, some people, they just, you just, you have to really be careful with who you select to be a part of your creative team to realize your story, your screenplay, because people will show their ass. They'll show you, you know, some people will, will really come through in pre-production and you think, yeah, even on production, but it's the little details, it's the little things like not remembering to save the sound onto their desktop so they have it as a backup, not the director not doing a storyboard when you've asked them to, not having a shot list when you've asked them to, um, a cinematographer not getting certain shots. Uh, and you hire them as a screenwriter actress so that you don't have to do it yourself but then they still fall short because they're not being attentive. Um, and it's, it's like, they're not taking it as seriously as if it were their project. Because some of these things, some of the mistakes that have happened with some of my films were avoidable. And I don't like pulling a woman card, but I'm gonna pull it. I feel like some of these things would have not would not have occurred if I were a man. And I try to stay in my very soft, um, laid back, cool, laugh out loud energy. I do, I love to laugh. But when you piss me off, when I trust you to deliver on what you said you would deliver creatively to my film project and you don't, it's annoying and I have to clean up with somebody to make, to optimize my movie, knowing it could have been optimized with the creative team if all of the team members did their work optimally, as I try to do. Um, also, when you are um, trying to find locations, and you, let's say you secure lo various locations for your film shoot, make sure you communicate thoroughly with the owner of the venue, the time in which you plan on being there, okay? Because if that communication is off, it can really shift things around. And it can, if the time is tight and you as an actress have to rush through your scenes because the owner saying they, they need you to basically vacate or get you, you know, gather up your film crew and your cast and your equipment because they need to open up for business. But they didn't communicate that to you. If the communication was off, like you thought you had more time than you did and then you've discovered much later on that you have to hurry. And now the performance is kind of compromised and the production because you're rushing to get out of this place of business. So these are some things that really, really keep in mind, really keep the communication wide open. Be even if you have to repeat to the owner. It's, so we have your you can we can, we are allowed and I pay for my spaces. I don't get locations for free. Sometimes people do um, are generous enough to loan out their home or place of business. So I will thank you. But those who don't have to pay, make sure you reiterate okay so i have i'm paying for 8 a.m to 4 p.m right no so i i can i can use your space from 8 a.m to 2 p.m 2 p.m right so i would add i would have them 
email you or text you so you have digital proof. Yes, China O Coliston can film in my place of business from 8 a.m. on June 6th, Thursday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's in writing. So this way, if they act brand new on you on the day of filming, you can show them the text and say, no, this is what you agreed on, okay? So we don't have to rush through this production and we can do the best optimal performances and optimal production. So I think that's pretty, I think that's what I can, that's what I can remember. Um, um, or, you know, oh, also too, you know, hey, you can direct your own film. I've done it. I mean, honestly, this is really weird. But when I've directed myself, and I usually, again, rehearse with the with my castmates one-on-one, -on -one, and I make my discoveries in my rehearsal as an actress for the character um, while directing them. Honestly, the films that I have written and directed myself, those are my strongest performances. Films where someone else directed me, it was not my strongest performance. Weird, right? When I wholly trusted somebody to direct me and help me produce my optimal, optimal performance, they did not. They fell short. So um, I'm a little distrustful of anybody directing me for film, for my things that I've written, not other people's film. That's different. Even, honestly, I'm going to go here. Sorry, I'm going to go here. Um, there was also, um, there was times where I was directed in, in a film someone else had written and I said to the person, do you want me to do something different? Do you want me to make an adjustment? Do you need me to make any? And they said, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's good. If you as an actress feel in your heart that you should modify your interpretation, give, do a little different, even though the director's like, no, don't make it, you're good. I did that and I was disappointed because I was like, why didn't he make me, why didn't he tell me to make an adjustment, to tone it down a little bit or turn it up, tweak it? Why? I asked him outright, should I make, do you want me to make any adjustments, make, do anything a little different? He's like, no, it's fine. It's like outside of Aaron Ingram, and I'm talking about for on camera, I've had a lot of good directors, good collaborative directors for theater, for stage, but on camera, it's been disappointing. I had a, one more instance where I was acting in a short film and it's one of my most prominent films I've done, honestly. Um, it's one of my favorite roles too. I was, it was two cameras and it was the, the writer was a director. The writer was a director. She was also in a movie and she hired an assistant director. Camera on me, camera on her. And the director was behind me and it was a scene where um, I'm acting with the character, the woman who wrote it. And I felt in my soul that that was not an honest very truthful interpretation. It wasn't my best and I felt it. And the director, the assistant director, he's behind me. So he can't even see what I'm doing. He just hear me. He's like, oh, it's fine, it's fine. I'm like, I just feel like it just been not being true for me. No, it's fine. And I went and so I said, fuck what he's talking about. Let me ask the writer, the writer actress. I said, do you mind if I do it again? She said, yeah, you can do it again, it's fine. I did it again. And it was very good, very strong. Now, what if I had what if I had trusted this dude who's sitting behind? How the fuck can you tell me it's fine and you can't even see what I'm doing? You only hear me. The actress writer looked at the, the, the she looked at my performance the second time and she's like, oh yeah, that was way better. That was yeah. 
but what if I didn't ask her if I can do it again? What if I didn't trust my creative instinct and I listened to this dude behind me? How are you directing behind me? I can't trust mofos, to be honest. What if I would have listened to him? This, this performance has been on CBS, NBC, Aspire, um, and film festivals in LA, in New York, San Diego, all over the place. What if I would have listened to him? Sometimes we cannot trust these, some of these directors. They're incompetent. They don't care. They'll leave you hanging. They just look at the. They just look at the aesthetic, the big picture. They're, they're not looking at, looking at the nuance of your performance. They don't care. They just some of them, some of them just want to be able to say they directed something, and put it on IG. So, you know, maybe you have a different experience. But for me, so far, I haven't been able to trust anybody fully um, as a director outside of the woman, the writer actress who was in the movie I was just referencing. She was a great director, honestly, great. Great, great actress too, and writer. So anyway, I hope this is helpful to you all. Just get the reels from all these crew that you hire and make sure these actors respect you, respect your vision, that you rehearse with them prior to filming. Uh, if they give you stinky attitude, fire them because there are a lot of talented people. But if that attitude is stank, I don't want to work with you. I do not. All right, you guys, have a nice Thursday. Peace, Chinese. Mr. Wilmington, it is a privilege to be your wife this day and the days ahead. I love you, babe. Happy anniversary. Aww. Thank you. Aww. My poem is titled, Dark Seed. Mommy, we can make liars out of the naysayers and bricklayers of deception. Those who have tried to curse my birth from its very inception. You, we both said we didn't want kids. I know. Matter of fact, you insisted on it. I know, I know, but that was five years ago. You know, I've changed my mind. Can we have this conversation? Can't you picture a little me or a little Idris Jr. running around here getting on my last? <laughs> You're just romanticizing shit. You're not thinking about how much we'd be giving up. There'd be no more me time. No more you, Tom. No more we, Tom. I wanna have your goddamn baby. I wanna have your baby! Sweet thing is you. Sweet thing is me. Sweet thing is our presence. 
the way we move, the way we talk, the way we sway, the way we smile, the way we show up, our voice, the bounce in our step, our swag, the way we laugh, the way we leave our sweet presence and the presence of others. Sweet thing is funky. Sweet thing is sassy. Sweet thing is soft. Sweet thing is gentle. Sweet thing is powerful. Sweet thing is resilient. Sweet thing is fun. Sweet thing is spunky. Sweet thing is unique. Sweet thing is you. Sweet thing is the way you walk and talk and your swag. It's a mood. It's a feeling. It's all of us. Get your Sweet Thing t-shirt at ChinaLColson.com Thank you. Bye, sugar.